Um, yeah, I'm. Um, I mean, Tess will do most of the introductions, I think, but I'm delighted to uh, introduce you guys to this fireside chat with uh, Teddy Short and with uh, Tess as our brilliant interviewer. So, yeah, um, take it away. Okay, I, I was largely going to let Tanya introduce herself, which is now I'm realizing probably quite rude. Um, but I will start by reminding everyone, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, I'm assuming I am, but uh, this is being recorded. Um, and the I think mostly the uh, um, kind of conversation between uh, Tanya and I is what's going to be actually posted, I believe. James can correct me if that's wrong, um, as opposed to the question time. Um, we're going to kind of split between a uh, um, conversation between us and some of the things that we've um, prepared that we think will be interesting to talk about and then hand over the questions from the audience, um, just like the previous session. Um, but I'll start with uh, letting Tanya, this is Tanya Short, uh, the <laughs> captain, I think, is that what's in your bio? The captain I, I of often go by games. captain. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, a game developer who is... Um, has a lot of really interesting experience and perspective to bring to the conversation today. So I'll hand over to you to tell us more about yourself. Sure. Um, so for context, um, I was going to just give a very, very brief uh, description of my background. So I started um, as an AI designer in uh, Age of Conan, um, which then was rebranded like eight times when it went free to play and then whatever, whatever. Um, but yeah, I was designing boss fights and, and AI for, for Age of Conan, which is an MMO back in, in 2008. Um, and then after a little while, uh, that company over in Norway, you might know them, Funcom, they also made The Secret World, which was more of a Illuminati monster fighting MMO. Um, I was a, a social systems designer on that one. Um, and then in 2013, I started Kickbox Games. And if you want more information, you can go to kickboxgames.com. But I'm just going to really quick go over the, the games that sort of got me into procedural generation. Uh, the Shattered Planet was our very first little game. Uh, we made it in about six to nine months. Um, and it has uh, some cellular automata generating these little rooms. But it's otherwise a fairly standard little roguelike um, turn-based uh, explore -em up uh, my next game, which I consider our first real game, my first real uh, baby, uh, was Moon Hunters, which is uh, a one to four player action RPG with uh, generated wilderness levels in between hand authored uh, kind of hub towns uh, set in a fictionalized ancient uh, Assyria or Samaria. Um, and around Sorry. this time, so this, this was 2013 to 2015. Uh, 2016 is when Moon Hunters came out, and I was realizing that that I really, really loved procedural generation as a designer, um, and so it started creeping in a little bit everywhere. But we never dove in super deeply until recently. But you'll notice, like the Shrouded Isle, I've written an article um, or two about the the personality generation there, that which I didn't fully design, but I was a writer, and my writing uh, instincts actually helped inform the, the generation of the, the villager personalities, which was kind of interesting. Um, six Ages, Tanya, we published- Tanya, sorry to interrupt. Tanya, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, were you wanting to be sharing the screen with the website? Yes, I, 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 I said to share screens. It did do the first one for the Conan oh, and no. then cut out. Okay. I'm not sure if you wanted ah. to have Kitbox. It was like yeah. per tab, cool. okay. So this is Shatter Planet, Beautiful. little explore map. Six months, Moon Hunters, Action RPG, a couple years, and then, yeah, um, I was in lesser uh, levels of involvement in some of the other ones, like Shrouded Isle, it was more of a writer, but it's a, it's a game about sacrificing your villagers that are procedurally generated, um, so we're trying to, realizing that those personalities needed to be exaggerated and, and kind of larger than life to be meaningful was, uh, was something. Um, Six Ages was actually published by us. I did neither design nor writing, but I was inspired um, by King of Dragon Pass, which many of you might know. Um, it's in the world of Glorantha, which is one of the most interesting uh, medieval, uh, well, not medieval, but much, much earlier than medieval, uh, ancient worlds, uh, I would say, fictionalized. Lucifer Within Us uses procedural generation. It's a mystery solving game, but the proceduralization is fully going, scrubbing back and forth through this timeline. So there's no random elements at all but there is a lot of interpolation happening uh, in, the, in the tech. 
Um, and then our most uh, famous internally developed game is Boyfriend Dungeon, which again has procedural generation dungeons, uh, if it action RPG elements, um, and that's about it. And then uh, Dwarf Fortress uh, was our published game that just came out and sold a lot of copies. Uh, yay, Dwarf Fortress, uh, the deepest procedural simulation world ever. Um, and our internally developed game now, which is not here anywhere because it's not announced, is uh, somewhat in con consultation with Tarn Adams from Dwarf Fortress. Um, but in many ways, it's more ambitious. It's 3D. And, and I can tell you, well, I can tell you some things, um, even though it's an unannounced game. So I shouldn't tell you too much. Um, but it's uh, a deep procedural simulation. Um, in, and it's, it's primarily in the world is primarily inspired by uh, around 500 AD Constantinople. And that is, uh, is our main fixation right now inside Kitbox. So that's me. Hi. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, so excited to hear about well, all of your work. But very oh, oh I forgot. I also was a co-editor on textbooks with Tarn from Door Fortress. Um, before we started working together, uh, like me being a publisher with him, we actually co-edited procedural generation in game design and procedural storytelling in game design. Um, if anybody knows of somebody who would like to help co-edit a uh, volume two or, or like version two or something like that, let me know. Uh, Cause we're currently looking uh, for, for co-editors on, on the next project. So. Cool. <laughs> um, I will keep an eye on the chat as well, but if anyone has anything they want to say uh, or respond to anything that's brought up, please use the chat as well as we go um, to, or hold on to your questions for a little while. Um, if you would like to say them out loud as well or put them in the chat later. Um, I think we might start with the the new game that you've just mentioned that is very exciting. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit more about the kind of basic concept behind it and the way that you're kind of planning to use that historical setting as inspiration and the way you're kind of bringing in sort of, I think you've mentioned before, some of the kind of fantastical elements into it too. If you want to explain that a little bit for us. Absolutely. And I mean, I know I haven't been able to, to be here for the rest of the conference, so I, and I apologize. I'm, I'm not an academic. I, I'm very much uh, in some ways a naive creator, so I apologize in advance for any, um, I don't know, faux pas or, or naivete. Uh, sorry, one of my lights just went out for some reason. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, so our next game, uh, which I'll, I'll say the code name rather than even our, our, our hopeful title. We'll call it the city game, okay? Because it's a procedurally generated city. Um, and like I said, it's supposed to evoke 580 Constantinople. Um, and the reason why I like to pick a very specific time and place to be inspired from is that we are a very small team and I, I want to spend our time as efficiently um, as possible but I also want a really deeply rich, internally coherent world. And so I feel like drawing from uh, whatever scholarship and understanding and knowledge of a real world place and culture as possible as a, as a, a foundation, I think really shortcuts uh, a lot of the things that you, like if I were a giant company and I, I sent a hundred concept artists and a hundred writers to go make a cool, little world well first of all that would be terrible don't don't do that but um even if it was one writer and one concept artist and they they sort of noodled on this little world like it would take them years and, and maybe decades to come up with a world as richly internally coherent as constantinople in 500 ad um and it might not even and even if it was as rich it might not be as um digestible to the average uh person playing it like if they walk up to it it might just look totally alien even if it does make sense within itself um, and I think people playing or, or encountering art, you know, they bring their own experiences to it. And so being able to make any intuitions that they're bringing valuable and help that shortcut any, any alienation of uh, their, that we're adding through the, the fantastical elements, I think is helpful. Um, so the fantastical elements that we're likely to add are things that we feel make the game more fun, usually. Um, so in our game, 
when you start the plan right now, which we still have a couple of years left development at least before we go into earliest access. So uh, bear with me if it's very different when it comes out. But right now the plan is you arrive penniless as an immigrant into this uh, giant city that's very wealthy, very bustling. Um, and you have to figure out how to survive. You have to get food. You have to, you're not allowed to sleep on the streets. That's, that's a, uh, you know, uh, not allowed by the, the guards and, and so forth. Um, and, you know, Constantinople did give out a daily bread. So theoretically, if you find a way to earn your daily bread, either by getting a trade or figuring out lodging or something like that, you might be able to, to make food that way. Um, but as you go, you sort of live your life. It's uh, we're calling it a grand life sim. And I think that the places we've deviated from the real world so far uh, are like I said, one, to make the, the gameplay more interesting. So if you're playing as quote unquote, a thief, it might be interesting if there are um, sort of supernatural, like supernatural shortcuts, I guess, or, or um, ellipses that help with sneaking and hiding and, and seeing uh, people who might see you, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's one thing. But the other reason why we might want to distance ourselves from real Constantinople is that there were real human rights issues that we don't want to have to deal with. We don't want to have to have um, slavery, for example, um, or uh, misogyny or hate crimes. Like these are the sorts of things that are good for, you know, if, if you're making art that's about that, that's great. But if you're not making art that's about that, I think that it can really skew the feeling of, of your work and, and really uh, dominate <laughs> the entire experience, especially if you're someone who experiences discrimination in real life. Um, one of our team members is actually Iranian. And, um, you know, we were originally discussing like, well, we, did, we know we want to have monotheism and other um, types of beliefs in there. Like how intolerant should um, our, our kingly figure, we call him the overlord, how, how intolerant should the overlord be compared to actual um, Justinian? And, uh, and he was like, Tanya, I can't really work on this very happily if I'm dealing with like religious oppression, like due to my everyday life, like my parents back in Iran are like dealing with a lot right now. Can we like discuss? <laughs> Um, so that's another reason to uh, to look at maybe not necessarily fantastical, but um, modern sensibilities, I guess, that don't really belong there. There's going to be probably a little bit more tolerance, a little bit more um, women's rights, um, a little bit more uh, focus on on what we what we want the game to be talking about, which is not those things. Yeah, um, I guess for the uh, naive historians in the room. Um, could you tell us a bit more? That's really interesting that um, some of that is kind of informed so directly by one of your team members that's working on the game um, and the kind of experiences that, that those people are bringing to the process as well as what you just, what you want the end product to look like. Um, so could you maybe tell us a bit more about how, at least for Kitbox, how your um, team kind of balances like decisions about what goes into the game and about what kind of different elements are being adapted from history, also in general, but from the kind of historical inspiration, I guess, as, a, as an example. Sure, I mean, it's, um, it, Kid Fox is a very collaborative culture. So ultimately, but we have hierarchy when it comes to decision-making. We like to make decisions very quickly, but we also have um, a lot of feedback, a lot of transparency. Um, everybody critiques everything, which is a little bit stressful for new hires often. Um, but ultimately, the decisions are based on whoever is the um, sort of responsibility holder for that team. So the great city is like six people, and it has a lead programmer, it has um, a lead character artist, a lead environment artist, and a lead designer. Um, executive producer and like so each person sort of handles like that final decision and if need be um, vetoes if like the whole team is going the wrong direction like the the lead programmer is like no I'm sorry we're not spawning a thousand individual grapes I don't care what gameplay or whatever you're thinking about we're not doing that I'm like oh, okay um, and similarly this was one of those things where theoretically as um, I'm more of an executive producer and content designer as a content designer if I'm saying, well, I think it's really important for the city that, that the overlord is uh, involved in oppressing the 
the other monotheisms that he's not involved in, um, like that would be my decision I'm able to make. Um, and I think that if we were to make the game about that, like I said, like I think that the like even our our people who have personal trauma to bring to the table, like that would, I'm sure they'd be into that if they were like, this is a game about this. Wow, like the, I have a lot to say about that. Um, but we knew that's not what the game was about. The game was about being a a survivor on the streets and living your life and and it being a commercial product and and uh, hopefully appealing to the the average Steam gamer. So um, taking all of that into consideration. Uh, it, the, the decision was ultimately mine, and I felt like we found a place that was good for the game's goals and also would be the most uh, exciting for the team at the same time. Mm. That's also, yeah, um, I think a really great point about lots of historical games uh, that are kind of drawing on um, particular settings that obviously when you create, especially open world games, are more kind of um, that have more kind of open interactive spaces that are obviously you know going to be filled with all these different things and and as a game designer you're never going to necessarily sort of fully realize or explore each of those elements as it would be in in a real world of all the diversity that that comes with that um so I wonder if if you want to maybe comment more about that with any of your other games that you've worked on about um how do you choose which kind of elements of a setting, whether it's historical or just um, a kind of completely fantasy or sci-fi, how, how do you kind of balance which parts you're deciding this game is about and that you are kind of exploring and how much to include of other elements? Well, what I didn't mention in my, in my self-introduction is that my background, actually, my undergraduate degree is in English literature. And I originally thought that I wanted to be a writer in games only. And it wasn't until I went through graduate school, I got a degree in level design that I realized like, oh, actually game design is massively powerful. And like actually making the backstory of a world is, is extremely, an extremely ineffective way to connect with players and affect their uh, in perspective of the world compared to gameplay design. So my dream quickly changed into to wanting to be more of a, a gameplay designer. Um, but I do have this background in, in writing, and I can say that it is very, very easy and common for designers to, you, you know, you write this much backstory and like the player can see this much, even in the best of times. And that's mm -hmm. fine because it, it makes that, that little slice they do see feel richer, more, co more coherent. It's informed by all this other stuff they don't see. That's great. But you have to be very, very careful because if this is like the minimum, like it's very easy to make this much and work for years on stuff that literally has no purpose. Like it's just, there was no point in spending a year detailing this whole feature that ended up getting cut and, and that there would never be a reference to. And actually that character died before the game started and you know, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so to answer your question, the way that I tend to approach um, world definition and setting definition is on an as needed basis. So for example, for the great mm -hmm. city, we had been making like reference pages of like furniture types and uh, imported foods and like recipes and like 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 really getting into everyday life. And we brought in scholars um, from a few different places to tell us what everyday life in uh, roughly 500 uh, AD Constantinople was like. Uh, as you all know, knowing the everyday life of the of a random citizen is much harder than knowing the everyday life of, of the leadership. Sadly, but. Uh, that's what we tried to focus on. Um, you know, where do they sleep and how many people are sleeping in that room and and what are they eating for breakfast? Oh, they don't eat breakfast. Okay. <laughs> All that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't until just now, and we've already been working on the game for a year and a half, that finally, finally, I felt like it was the right time. It was, it was, it was definitely needed for me to start defining, like, what was the backstory of the world in a very basic way. Like, did, was there a big empire that collapsed or it was in the process of collapsing? Is this the capital of an empire that is already like in the, in the phases of collapsing? Are there barba barbarians? Mm. Are there other civilizations out there that have different priorities that are attacking the city? Like what, what is the international situation right now? Because even though the game is in the city, those kinds of things are going to inform how immigrants act and what people are worried about and, and that sort of thing. But it didn't make sense to define that until we were sure that we understood what the moment to moment gameplay would really feel like. And so that's true for our past games as well. Like Moon Hunters, 
I defined, you know, these different little cultures that you encounter that are basically equivalents of like the Assyrians or the, the Sassanids or whatever. Um, and, and I would define them as we realized that, yes, we, were, we are going to encounter this and this is the context and this is how the player will see them. And then I can, I can define like, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this for this slice as opposed to I'm gonna do this and hopefully a slice is in there. I feel like that's probably a good transition point then into the procedural generation kind of side that I'm really keen to, to talk about. Um, from the, the sort of point you're making about, you know, where do people sleep and what they eat and these all these little elements. So I'm wondering, maybe to, to start into that part of the question, if you if you could talk briefly about your kind of general perspective on procedural generation and how you're using it in all the games, but in, in this one uh, in particular, if we start there. Yeah, I mean, the best practice, which always feels like a giant waste of time and everyone's very impatient, the best practice as a creator is always to hand author the thing that you want to generate, right? You build out this thing that is roughly what your goal is, and then you reverse engineer it and try to figure out, okay, how do we make that, like, what are the rules that I was using to build that, that I wouldn't have noticed until I actually built the thing? And so... For even for Shattered Planet back in 2013, <clears throat> wow, uh, we realized like, okay, if I build the, I, I built a little tutorial level that we, it was also helpful for playtesting because, you know, we wouldn't necessarily have anything playtestable for a few months uh, if we waited for the generation to, to be built, but I could hand author something and then test it on players and, and iterate on the, the gameplay while the, the generation was being worked on. And that's exactly the same process that we ended up using for the for the city game that we hand built a little prototype um, using unity store assets we hand built a little like extremely generic medieval uh little little village um but you can live your life in that village and you can cook and you can throw oranges and you can trip someone and and you can pickpocket and like that sort of thing um and then when we actually got around to starting the city generation, it was only a few months ago, uh, we first hand built one and then and then looked back at um, how do we how do we generate from there. So yeah, I mean, I guess I guess that's the that's the starting point of how how our process works. Um, but it's once we're in the the midst of actually working on the generation, it is for me, it's always about <clears throat> envisioning that individual moment with the player, the, the, the moment to moment of how will the player navigate through this place? How will they perceive this? What context will they have? And then like, what are our goals? What do we want them to feel when they're navigating through this place? And are we doing that? Inevitably, no, we're not, we need to improve it. So that's, uh, that's why it's a useful question. And how, so what, what kind of elements of the city game are procedurally generated then and what, or, or will be, obviously. Um, and, and I guess, yeah, how, how does that kind of draw on the historical inspiration of the city? Are they sort of particular parts of the physical world or of the characters, the NPCs, things like that, that are going to be, I guess, in some ways you, you come up with the, the base of the historical inspiration for it and then each version of it is different but maybe you could comment on that a bit more yeah so our our generation is going to be relatively um shallow i guess by some measures because it's not like we're going to generate the civilization from from a, a starting founding point or anything like that uh it will in many ways always be the same tone um, we're trying to keep a, a pretty consistent tone in terms of what kind of city is generated. So it'll always be Constantinopolian looking. Um, our current name for the city is Athenopolis. Um, and it'll have the meze, the, the big street towards in the middle of the city and little streets coming out of it. And the big street will lead from the main central gate up to the, the palace, which is probably closed in early access. Um, but the neighborhood, I probably have to get water in a moment. Uh, I didn't Absolutely. bring water with me for some reason. My coffee is like attacking my throat somehow. The, the grains are in there, I guess. Um, 
but the neighborhoods will be different. You know, maybe the, the bathhouse is over here, the, the more rich villa neighborhoods are more over here, the, the meze goes northeast to southeast, or, you know, that versus north to south or versus west to east, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but it's always on a peninsula, it's always surrounded by great giant walls, it's always a city state. And it's kind of a similar approach to the NPCs and the culture, which is, you know, it always has this overlord who has a, a very um, stylish empress. Um, and there are all, there is always a dominant monotheism that's attached uh, to him that he's backed and that he's uh, making a, a giant church for it, probably still in the middle of construction or something. Um, and there's always a world wonder of some kind that's mildly fantastical in some way. Um, but the details are always different. Like, and, and what makes up a person is probably always the same too. They're always a, a certain couple of traits and they have a job that they do every day and they sleep at a certain place and, they, and, and that sort of thing. But the actual details of that person and the details of the overlord and the details of the monotheism are uh, built modularly from pieces that we've authored. So like right now we're discussing at early access having two or maybe three possible uh, monotheisms that it picks from like a, like a deck. Um, but if we build the assets for those monotheisms well and modularly in mind, it'll be easier and easier to add more in the future. So if we're like, okay, this monotheism, its exaggerated qualities are about um, erudition and uh, uh, healing or something like that. And then this other one is about erudition and darkness. Oh, then maybe it's really easy for us to take healing and darkness and make a make another one about that or whatever. Um, and it's the same with with people. Like if we have a a table of names and a, and we have um, you know a, a a large number of traits to build from. As long as our systems underlying the traits is well made adding more traits that can pop up in, in people and, uh, and observable behaviors will be easier and easier and uh, make it exponentially more valuable as we, we keep developing and, and updating the game. Do you want to pause there and get a drink of water? Yes, my, I, yes. I need to, yeah. yes. <laughs> no worries, go do that. Uh, everyone can start thinking about your questions. I've got a couple more and then we will uh, pass over to audience questions soon. So ponder what you would like to ask Daniel whilst we get to that. Hello, yes. No worries. Uh, have you had a drink of water? Actually do the drink, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Okay. A um, couple more and then we'll um, open up to audience questions. Um, I guess I wanted to uh, tie into what you were just talking about and connect to our theme a little bit more for the workshop overall which is about this kind of landscapes and spaces um you talked a little bit about the city and how it's kind of different each time so i was wondering if you could tie in to um how using the kind of procedural generation and however you are kind of designing your games works for um i guess more the sort of broader landscape in other games and those kind of exploratory spaces um in terms of creating a kind of landscape how, how does that tie in with some of what you're using historically inspiration for as well well i think the main two reasons why i really love procedurally generating spaces um have and unfortunately i'm not sure i can connect it to the medieval the historical side of it at all but um like the the main one honestly is development um the main reason i love it is because as a developer i just enjoy procedural generation so much more as like a having this little co-author that can surprise me sometimes is um it just makes the development a thousand times more pleasurable especially because games take multiple years uh typically 
Um, having a game that just doesn't have any surprise, it is purely 100% predictable. Um, I can't, I can't keep up the joy in the same way. Um, now there's the sub point there that the, the other reason for development that is very useful is that it lets us iterate in a way and again, this is more pleasurably. You could theoretically iterate in, on authored content this way, but the iterations that we can make affect the entire game all at once in a way, right? Like for Moon Hunters, for example, we launched with, I think, four biomes. It was like forest and mountains and swamps and something else. Um, and then after launch, we added a fourth biome, which, or fourth or fifth, whatever, um, snow biome. And immediately all everyone's worlds was like 25% more varied. And, and that's the kind of improvement that like, it doesn't mean that we actually saved time. It probably would have been faster to just hand build 30 levels and then add another five levels. But by doing it the way we did it, not only did we enjoy it more, but also um, the immediate improvement of, of everyone's levels infinitely from then on was, was a kind of a magical upgrade. And if we'd, if we'd kept adding mm -hmm. to it, it would have been more and more, like, like I said, exponentially uh, more efficient to keep adding more content and, and making everyone's experience more varied. Um, but I think that the other benefit, again, not necessarily historical related, but um, the fact that, especially for a game that, like The Great City, which might involve, or sorry, the, the city game, I didn't say its name, Ooh, um, like the city game, uh, if you have um, stealth and thieving type elements, I think that there's a, a lot more richness, especially in our post-streaming culture, in having a game that can't really be spoiled, that can't really have a perfect um, walkthrough game fact. And so having the play and and and, I, and maybe this does this is where it comes back to the the historical um, connection in that the player is also more of a co-author at that point, right? Because they are curating what they tell other people. They're noticing what's meaningful. They're defining for themselves and their and and the stories they tell each other um, in this experience of the world that was generated for me, what matters. And I feel like when it's a completely fictional world, it's a lot more to sort through. Whereas I think when you, again, give them these kind of shortcuts um, to sort of understand the kind of world you're building by signaling certain historical elements or contemporary, but like the, the point is like real world um, analogs, it gives them a foothold to then have less of a cognitive load of, of taking in everything else because they're like, oh, I'm sure the average person will look at our gate at the at the city game and be like, oh, it's Rome. And then like, that's fine. It'll, it'll get them like half the way there. And that's all right. Um, and then, you know, as they get in deeper, they'll be like, oh, it's a little bit different. Um, and that's fine. But like even just thinking, oh, it's ancient Rome will like help them to be able to process all the other things going on that are, are kind of um, exhausting and overwhelming, honestly. Um, like that's how I, that's how I feel about approaching like paradox games, Crusader Kings, that kind of thing. Is that the familiarity of a lot of the the elements definitely helps my brain set aside something. Whereas if it was all fictional names, oh, there's no way, no way. Um, if it was just a bunch of fictional countries and uh, and rulers and and churches and things, woo, impossible. <laughs> um, a side comment, and then I will pick up on that for my very last question before we open up. Um, but I think one thing that's really interesting you just sort of said about that idea of kind of everyone's experience being different each time and, and things like that is also interesting in a kind of procedural rhetoric sort of way about what it says about the past and, and this kind of idea that these space, like the world of the past isn't static or isn't able to be viewed as like one thing, but it's, it's kind of different from every perspective and, and each time we think about it and access it. I think that's really interesting about procedural generation. Um, which people might have more questions about. Um, but I, I wanna I wanna talk about boyfriend dungeon. <laughs> um, sure. Quickly. Um, I'm really I'm really interested in that uh, kind of use of obviously the dungeon space is a very particular kind of genre convention, very particular kind of space and um, set of expectations about uh, gameplay. So I, I would love if you could talk about how that worked using that for a kind of dating sim type game um 
and what the kind of connotations of the idea of kind of dungeon crawling and things like that were that kind of how that how that worked with that game I mean, that's a, that's a big question. Um, it is. I mean, the, the short answer is that for all the reasons I said before about uh, why procedural generation, uh, mm -hmm. we tend towards procedural generation of, uh, of challenge spaces, especially, um, was 100% uh, or 1000% true for Boyfriend Dungeon, where we had decided that we weren't brave enough to procedurally generate the boyfriend swords um we were like no we we're not confident that we don't want to make the kind of comedy game where the boyfriend swords are are procedurally generated and and weird in that way we want to hand author uh their appeal and and the dating sim elements we want to be kind of traditionally appealing in that way um and then when it comes to the dungeons we always saw them as kind of this pacing break of like okay for five minutes i'm engaging in this authored conversation with somebody flirting, being flirted with, whatever. And then after four or five minutes, I'm going to go and like mash and beat up some monsters. And it's not like super challenging, but it is a different brain space. And then by the time mm -hmm. I've done that for five or 10 minutes, I'm ready to go back and read some more because that's the kind of player I am. I really can't. I love reading in real life, like with a book, but like when I'm looking at my computer monitor, it is not where I want to be reading lots of text. Sorry, academics. I know you like sending giant PDFs and and eBooks and things like that, but I'm uh, I if unless it's an e-reader, I'm not into it. Um, and so yeah, for video games, similarly, I also if I have a large quantity of text, I'm just uh, no, give me give me some buttons to mash for a little while in between. Um, and then yeah, procedurally generating them helped helped the players interact with it kind of as many times as they wanted like it also puts the puts the power in in with the player of they can decide like i want to engage with it generating again or not whereas if i had just hand built a certain number of levels i'm sort of dictating to them this is the number of times you will encounter this content in meaningfully whereas for them especially for a game where like it has roguelike elements so what that means is you know if you die in the middle you're going to have to restart um, when you have that kind of gameplay challenge, I think that there is a certain uh, level of compassion in saying, well, at least we'll make it a little bit different. You don't have to do it exactly the same again, even d just because you lost. Like, we're not going to punish you uh, too much because, yeah, going back to the start of a hand-authored level is, is ultimate punishment, in my opinion. <laughs> um, all right. We might... I think that's a good spot to kind of open up. Um, we've already got some some comments and questions in the chat i can see someone asked about the q a section 